Good morning. Good morning. A very warm welcome to you all to our worship here at Castle Methodist Church, Colchester. To those joining us online and those listening to the recording of this service during the week ahead, may God bless us all as we are united in fellowship with one another. Today we welcome our minister, the Reverend Alan Jenkins, to lead our worship. Welcome, Alan. So let us prepare ourselves with a moment of quiet, remembering we're here in the presence of our Lord. Good morning everybody. We're here this morning on the Feast of Christ the King, which is to say it's the last day of this year of the lectionary, which means next week is the first Sunday in Advent. Does that worry you? Because of course the first Sunday in Advent means it's only five Sundays before Christmas, and I don't know about what four is it? I can never quite work out whether it's five or four. I think it's five. Which, which means, of course, that a whole year ago we were in lockdown and wearing masks and stuff. And we don't seem to have gone much further forward, do we, apart from one, two or three jabs, depending on where we are in the programme. Time marches on, as they say. But we march on in anticipation. And we begin that anticipation today by, by thinking about the concept of Christ the King. Christ the King will discover of what? But since we're thinking about Christ the King, we're going to continue in worship as we sing our first hymn, a rather traditional hymn, I have to say, um, from Singing of Faith, number 94. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. That's what I thought. Hang on. That says, Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. This says, To God be the glory. What are you playing? Oh, I was right then. In that case, I've just read that out loud and thought, I'm sure that's wrong, but it can't be. But it is. So, we are not going to sing that, but it is, the tra- it is a traditional hymn. To God be the glory, great things he has done.
Now Barbara is going to lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Holy God, we meet with you in the most unexpected places, not just in the places we call holy or amongst the people we call, uh, call themselves righteous or chosen or enlightened, but in the difficult places where people are scarred by life and bear the marks of the damage which your perf imperfect children inflict on a perfect world. Jesus, our brother and saviour, we are met by you in even the darkest corner of our lives. You reach out to us and call us to yourself in love. You remind us that nothing is hidden in the lives of those who trust you, that even our darkest corners are illuminated and cleansed by the light of your love. Free-flowing spirit, by whom the whole creation is blessed, and through whom all human love is expressed, you surround us with divine love and instill in us divine purpose. Your care is the spark of our compassion and your strength is the heartbeat of all that is in this universe that is good and true and which wholly reflects your will that nothing is wasted, no one abandoned and all are able to come to you in hope and joy and expectation. So we praise you, glorious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, our eternal Lord, our loving Saviour, and the source of all life. Amen. Father, hear our confessions, for in the quietness of our own hearts, we reveal to ourselves in your presence the reality of who we are and the depth of our shame at our own action and inaction, at our acceptance of evil and our moral paralysis in the face of injustice, unjustifiable hatred and vicious prejudice and bigotry. Forgive us, Lord God, in the name of your Son and in the power of your Spirit. Forgive us and free us Free us not from consequences of our own poor choices, but so that we might be liberated, liberated to face what we have become, to change the way we are, and when faced with our own imperfections, to address the needs of others first, even at cost to ourselves. Amen. And now we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Barbara. Now, if all the kids could come up here, I want to have a chat with you. Before you go out to Sunday school. And then you're going to come back later and show us what you've done, I hope, with a bit of luck. Now then. Yeah, you can sit together if you like, and I'll stand here. That's it. Brilliant. Jake, are you going to sit with your sister? Brilliant. Okay, now then. I need to ask you something. If I was to tell you that I was a farmer, now we all know that's not true because I'm not, but let's just pretend, okay? If I was to say I'm a farmer, where would you expect me to live? Yeah? In a field, Jacob says. <laughs> no, that's not, that's, just, that's fair enough. And you said, in a farm, which is, you know, okay. So how would you expect me to dress if I was a farmer, you know, sort of break, broad, broadly? Would you expect me to be wearing a black suit like this? No. Okay, what would you think I'd wear then? Big boots. Big boots, yeah. Probably Wellingtons, I should think. What do you think, big Wellingtons? Do you think they'd be nice and shiny like my, sh like my shoes? 
Do you think they'd be nice and shiny like my shoes? What would they be? Dirty? Okay, right, okay. And what sort of things would a farmer be working with? What tools do you think a farmer would have? One of the girls want to have a go? A spade? Yeah, why not? What else? Jacob? Sorry? Oh, seeds. Yeah, well, I suppose they're kind of... To, yeah, well, you scatter seeds, don't you? But if you wanted to, to do something to the ground before you scattered the seeds, what would you have, yeah? A plough? That would be towed by a tractor, something like that. So there'd be lots of equipment, wouldn't there? And you expect me... Okay, so let's move on a bit. If I was to say to you, if you were to meet me and say, oh, you've changed your job, you're not in your black suit with your clerical collar now, if I were to tell you that I had indulged myself and bought myself a shop and I, was a, and I was a jeweller, I had a jeweller's shop, you can tell what I always fancy doing, couldn't you? And if, I, if, you know, if I had a jeweller's shop and I, and I repaired jewellery, what would you expect to see? Me, what do you expect, how would you expect me to be like? Would you expect me to be dressed in this black suit? So what do you think a jeweller would dress in? Somebody making things. Pardon? Bracelets. Oh yes, so you have lots of bracelets around him, that's true, and rings and, and necklaces, but perhaps I'd wear an apron. Do you think I'd wear an apron? Do you think it's because actually making jewellery and repairing jewellery, it, I suppose you can get quite dirty doing that, can't you? So if you saw me in a, in a jeweller's apron and you're carrying little tools, I'd have a little bag of tools, wouldn't I, that I'd use? That's what you expect to see, wouldn't you? Okay. Well, do you know, we call Jesus a king, don't we? We say Jesus is our king. So what would you expect, where would you expect a king to live? In a castle, possibly, right over there. Where else? In a palace, Jacob. You expect to see him in a palace. Now, what would you, how would you describe a palace? What would, you, what would you be your description of a palace? What do you think would be inside a palace? Gold. Gold, yeah? What do you think, what, what else would you find inside a palace, do you think? Hmm? I'm going deaf in my old age. What did you say? A throne. Oh, a throne. Sorry, I'm definitely going deaf, yeah. A throne, Exactly. We haven't got a throne in here, have we? No, I can't show you. It's of a throne. And, and what else would you expect to see a king? What do you expect to see a king wearing, Jacob? A crown. A crown. A crown. That'd be great, wouldn't it? What else perhaps would a king have as apart from a crown? Yeah? Layered clothes. Layered clothes. That's right. You expect a king to be in fancy clothes. Yes, Jacob? Jewels. Jewels. Yes, you'd expect to see a king laden with jewels, wouldn't you? But we don't see Jesus like that, do we? When we call Jesus the king, he, he doesn't live in a, didn't live in a palace, did he? Where, did, where was Jesus born? In a stable. And, and what was his bed? Was it a big sumptuous four-poster bed with thick duvets? What was it? A manger. And yet we call Jesus a king. Well, why? What, what's, what is it about kings? Why do we call kings? Why do we put, give them crowns? And why do we give them jewels? And why do they live in big palaces? Because they're... Pardon? Well remembered. Yes, they are. It's, I think it's because they're, they think, people think they're special. Don't they? They're special people. And actually, if you think about it, there are some parents who call their children who are very special to them, they call them princes and princesses. Have you ever driven along in a car and seen a, a sign on the back of a car that says, drive carefully, I'm carrying a little prince, or something like that, or a little princess. You know the sort of thing. I've, you've seen that, haven't you? Or an angel. Yes, sometimes they say that, don't they? And, and, and sometimes when I see those signs, it makes me want to crash into those cars even more. No, it doesn't really. It doesn't really, but I'm just saying it doesn't make me drive any more carefully that the person in front thinks the person in their car is a prince. But what they're really saying is that child is very special to them, aren't they? Very precious. So they're their princess or their prince. So maybe we call Jesus a king because he's so special. Yeah? 
So what I want you to do when you go to Sunday school, I want you to think about all the things that make Jesus special to us and why we call him a king. And we'll see then whether the ones that we sometimes call kings here and are covered in jewels and crowns and everything else are as special as they think they are compared to Jesus and see how special he is to us. Is that okay? Is that all right? You can do that. So when you come back, we'll send someone out, Don or someone, will go out during the last, or no, the next to last, the intercessions or something, don't you know, at the end, and bring you back and you can tell us what you've done, maybe even show us what you've done. Is that all right? Excellent. Right, let's have a prayer before you all disappear then. Not all of you, just these. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing on we who seek to learn more of your purpose for us and your love for us and who seek to learn together how special we are to you as you are to us. Amen. Let's sing now. Tell me that's the right one this time. Yes, it is. Excellent. Good. Um, So we're going to sing again while the children go out. From Singing of Faith 134, Christ whose glory fills the skies. Now we're going to hear our Old Testament lesson and our New Testament lesson from Revelation and from 2 Samuel. Our first lesson is taken from the second book of Samuel, chapter 23, verses 1 to 7. Now these are the last words of David. The oracle of David, son of Jesse, the oracle of the man whom God exalted, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the favorite of the strong one of Israel. The spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His word is upon my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, one who rules over people justly ruling in the fear of God, is like the light of morning, like the sun rising on a cloudless morning, gleaming from the rain on the grassy land. Is not my house like this with God, for he has made me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. Will he not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? But the godless are all like thorns that are thrown away, for they cannot be picked up with the hand. 
To touch them, one uses an iron bar or the shaft of a spear, and they are entirely consumed in fire on the spot. And the second lesson is from the Revelation of John, chapter 1, verses 4b to 8. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Thanks be to God. Our third hymn from Singing the Faith is 335. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore.
Now we hear our Gospel lesson for today from John's Gospel, the 18th chapter. Our Gospel reading is taken from John chapter 18, verses 33 to 37. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king? For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Thanks be to God. So we sing again. Didn't seem very long between the hymns, did it there? But there we are. We sing from Singing the Faith, number 318, Christ our King before creation.
Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If I were a filmmaker, which I'm not, and I was given carte blanche to do kind of biopic that is so, be you know, so beloved of so many filmmakers, I wonder if you could guess who I would make a biopic of. I'll give you a clue, it isn't Jimmy Greaves. Right? Or any, indeed any, any footballer. Right? So you can lay that aside. I wonder if you would guess, and I, I, I'll have to say this because no, as far as I know, nobody has made a biopic of this person, and I'm astonished, frankly. Um, and that person is John Wesley, the, the founder of the Methodist Church. The reason I say I'm astonished is because, you know, his life was packed full of incident. Uh, if you read his journals, I mean, they're a bit of a dry old read, if I'm honest. A lot of the time, they're a bit of a dry old read because they're written, obviously, in 18th century English. Um, but it's interesting that John, well, yeah, it is interesting that John Wesley actually wrote two sets of journals. He wrote one for public viewing and one for private viewing. Did you know that? No, no, I didn't. Every year, John Wesley's journal, you read it. And the ones we read, I think, are the public ones. I've never read the private ones, but he definitely kept them. But even the public ones are amazingly full of incident. I mean, he talks about when, for example, he was... Um, Ba banished by the Bishop of Bristol from preaching in any, any church in the Diocese of Bristol um, on the grounds that the Bishop of Bristol considered him to be a terrible enthusiast. In the 18th century, that was actually an insult, you know, to be an enthusiast. A and how he was also de um, deprived, as they say, deprived the pulpit of his father's church, where his father had been the, the vicar for many, many years in Epworth, in um, Lincolnshire. And, uh, and he, was, uh, he was deprived the pulpit. So instead, he went outside the, the church, and it was announced that he would do this. And a huge crowd turned up, and he stood on his father's tomb, because his father's tomb is one of those ones that sits above ground, you know, like a box. And he stood on it. Mind you, he had to stand on it, because he was about five foot nothing. Well, no, maybe not. He was quite small, even for the 18th century. So much so that um, when he preached in Cornwall at St. Germans, he had to, um, he, had to sta he had to preach from inside a house to the crowd outside, otherwise they'd never have seen him because um, the crowd was so huge and they might have crushed him. So he would stand inside the house, in, this, in the window of this house in St. Germans, and stand on a stool so he could be seen by the crowd outside. And I know that's true because the church I was minister of in Lisgard, which is not far from St. Germans, it's not in the same circuit anymore, but it was then, uh, Lisgard Methodist Church, as it used to be called Wesley Methodist Church, Lisgard, still has the stool which Wesley stood on to preach through a window at St. Germans. It's got a little plaque on it and everything, silver plaque saying that's what it is. And it's kept under the pulpit. So if you ever go to Lisgard Methodist Church, hi there if you're watching, it's, it's still under the, I hope it's still under the pulpit there. Uh, it was when I, I left, I didn't take it with me. Um, but whenever you used to show people around and take the stool out and put it down, do you know what? Every now and again, someone would feel the need to stand on it. And do you know what? Every time someone did, you could guarantee they were one of two things. They were either a Methodist minister on holiday or a local preacher. Lay people never did such a thing. You know, that's how it was. But there we are. So was it? But when he was in Wensbury, those are, those are delicate things. When he was in Wensbury, in the West Midlands, again, not far from somewhere I served, there is no connection between these incidents, by the way. Just that I'm not quite as well-traveled as Wesley, but I've been around a bit. Uh, at Wensbury, not far from where I was in the West Midlands, it's recorded in John Wesley's journal that they, um, they dragged him through the streets by his hair. They wouldn't do that with me, would they? Uh, they dragged him through the streets with, by his hair and, and threw him in the village duck pond. All at the instigation of the local squire and the local vicar. Currently, I haven't got a vicar at, at St. Botolph, so I might be glad of that, I don't know. 
But, but they, that's what they did to Wesley. And at another point, I'm not sure that it was Wednesday or somewhere else, they set a bull on him when he was preaching. And those just a few of the incidents in that very long, instant-filled life. But of course, that's because, you know, Wesley was a threat. Methodism was a threat to the establishment. Why? Well, that's what we're thinking about today. Why? Because Methodism, although it claimed otherwise in many ways, denied the establishment. Methodism rebuked the establishment. The practice of being Methodist in itself was a criticism of the government of the day as it was, was a criticism of the world as it was. And that made Methodists radical. That made Methodists dangerous. That meant Methodists were, if you like, loose cannons on the deck of the ship, as far as the establishment was concerned, as far as those in power were concerned. And it meant the Methodists, in the end, were those who were identified with the poor, and identified with those who were downtrodden and oppressed. And if you take the, pl if you take the part of the oppressed and the downtrodden and the discriminated against, soon you become discriminated against. You become the problem to the establishment. Now I have to say, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Because establishments and kings and presidents, it doesn't matter what system of government you use, this is not an anti-royalist diatribe, but the establishment of any order the way that human beings are, always results in marginalization of the oppressed and the poor and those unable to defend themselves. And that's why, as a, as a, a, a movement, Methodism has always been on the fringes. And actually, it's why we have always been most comfortable on the fringes. Now, we've had a few Methodists who have not had that attitude post Wesley, I mean, to be honest with you, John Wesley had quite a high, uh, a high Tory uh, political outlook. John Wesley himself was often referred to in his own lifetime as Pope John uh, because of his rather autocratic way of, of, of doing things. But at heart, John Wesley was on the side of the poor. And Methodism evolved from Wesley's radical uh, outreach into an, a movement which called upon the, uh, the, the nation to change. And you have to ask yourself, why would that be? Why is Christianity as a whole, actually, when it's in its purest form, rather anti-establishment? Well, it's because of today, because of the Feast of Christ the King, if you like, because of our attitude towards Jesus Christ. Because as Christians, we hold no allegiance to nationality. I, I, I be careful how you read and hear that sentence. As Christians, we hold no allegiance to nationality. Now, it's not true to say that we, that as gen generally, we do that. We identify ourselves, don't we, by our nationality very often. You know, we are say we say we're proud to be English or Welsh or Scottish or Irish, and you know I you know, make a play about my, my Welsh ancestry. But actually, I wasn't born in Wales. And the fact that I was born in the East End of London doesn't make me that proud of being a Londoner. The fact that I was born in England was just a mis you know, it's just a matter of luck. I had no say in the matter. None whatsoever. And most people don't have much say, do they? Even in where their own children are born, let alone themselves. It's literally an act, often an accident of birth. I, I have friends in Cornwall who were, uh, very, who were very proud of being Cornish, but I know that one of them was born on the ferry between Cornwall and Devon while her mother was on the way to hospital in Plymouth to give birth to her. So was she? Cornish or Devonian? Don't ask, because she's a twin. 
and she was the firstborn. The other twin was actually born in Devon. But the fact is, we have no control over where, oh, well, not much control, no control over where we're born, and not much control over where we live. It's circumstance. I, I, I recall spending quite a lot of my childhood assuming that within a few months or even a couple of years, I was going to be living in Australia. My parents always had this um, dream of emigrating to Australia, of becoming 10-pound poms, as they call them, partly because most of our family were already there. But we never did it. We never did it. But we could have done. And I could have been talking to you with an Australian accent right now, having, uh, you know, having played for my country at cricket. Except I wouldn't have done. But you know, we have no choice, really. Even circumstances too often dictate where we grow up. So our nationality doesn't make us dangerous. Our politics, in a way, don't make us dangerous because if we subscribe to a political theory or join a political party, we're becoming part of a known quantity, aren't we? You know, you, everybody knows what a Tory is. Everybody knows what a, 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 a socialist is or a liberal democrat to a large extent. You can kind of tick off what makes someone a Tory or tick off what, someone makes, a social, what makes someone a socialist and you can, you can kind of box them up that way, can't you? But actually to be a Christian goes beyond that. To recognise Christ as king takes us beyond all of those chosen attributes of politics or those imposed attributes of nationality. Because when we proclaim Christ King in our own lives and in the life of our community, then our allegiance is higher than nationality. Higher, in a sense, even than humanity itself. We accept Christ as King of all creation. And that surely makes it necessary for us as Christians to acknowledge our role in nurturing creation and in nurturing all of God's creatures. To acknowledge Christ as king is not to place Christ in a box in the way, or, or on a pedestal in the way that we do with political leaders or even religious leaders. To acknowledge Christ as king is, is not, to, not to see Christ as some supreme being just being out there somewhere to acknowledge christ as king is to recognize that he has his place in our lives that his love suffuses our hearts and our souls and changes who we are and therefore changes how we react to those amongst whom we live it it if you like transforms who we are and informs what we do. And that makes us dangerous. I hold no allegiance to Her Majesty the Queen, other than that which I'm legally required to do to get a passport, any more than I hold any allegiance to a Prime Minister or a President. We obey the laws because, you know, basically the law is good for us. But the framework of true justice is not the law that, we are, that is imposed upon us by a government or a parliament, by a prince or a president. The framework of true justice is that which we adopt when we accept Christ as king of our lives. And then we see a pure form of justice which genuinely has no favourites. Now, earlier this week, <clears throat> when I was writing this and con contemplating this service, I was waiting for a verdict. You may recall that um, in, in America, a few months ago, a young white male, who is unashamedly a white supremacist, took a gun to a riot, an assault rifle, actually crossed the state line with a, a, a firearm, which I believe is, is actually a crime in itself, in the United States, without permission crossed the state line with a firearm, 17-year-old, dropped off by his mum at a riot. I mean, these are, these are facts that are undisputed. In the course of that riot, he shot dead two men and seriously injured another. And he went to trial. I was waiting for the verdict to come on maybe Tuesday or Wednesday. It didn't come. But it came a couple of days ago. 
and he was acquitted on all, all charges. Acquitted, despite what is known to have happened. Now, when that happens, everybody calls into question the veracity of the justice system that allows that to happen. But we here cannot be complacent because there are also miscarriages of justice in the other direction. People who are clearly innocent who are being found guilty and held on death row in the States, but it happens here also. People who are clearly guilty going free. 98% of all rapes do not reach a guilty verdict in court. And it's not the fault of the police, and it's not the fault of the investigators or even the CPS. It's what happens, it's the system. So there is no human justice system which is wholly just. There is no framework of true justice which we can claim as human beings is ours. True justice only comes when we as Christians live the Christian life, live out what Christ calls us to be. Some of that is going to cost us. Much of it, maybe, will cost us. It makes us dangerous people, you see. Have a look around at you, at all these dangerous people. But if we call Christ the King, we are denying kingship to any other power source, if you want to call it that. If we call Christ King of our lives, then his justice and his love, the framework of true justice, supersedes all other. That makes us dangerous, like Wesley. That makes us dangerous like Sophie Scholl, who I've, I've uh, extolled to you before. That makes us dangerous because we call upon God to empower us to change the world. And if the world doesn't change, then the world is doomed. The world needs to be changed. The human race needs to have its um, priorities realigned. The human race needs to embrace a framework of true justice that allows human beings to discover God's love for themselves and themselves to call upon Christ's kingship as their, as their validation and as their security. For it's the only security we have. God's love, God's grace, God's justice in Christ, the King of us all. Amen. And now Barbara's going to lead us in intercession. Responses. In our intercessions, will you please remember Linda? Linda is the daughter of Pamela and Terry Abbott. And at the moment, Linda is suffering from COVID. So we want to hold her in our prayers. When I say, here we are, the servants of the Lord, would you please respond, let it be with us according to your word. Here we are, the servants of the Lord, let it be with us according to your word. Friends, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you have filled the earth with good things and we have laid claim to more than we can truly need. We pray for all who find themselves so desperate that their own sense of empathy is weakened, so dulled that they themselves, though weak, pray on those who are even more vulnerable. We pray for those whose greed is so great that no title or honor or achievement is ever fulfilling so insecure in themselves that they seek validation in possessions and security in vain praise, when no possession, no ownership ever fully satisfies and no empty public accolade can ever hide our true nature from you or from ourselves. 
Father, help us to see ourselves not only as we are, but as you intend us to be. Bless us into becoming the children of your promise and effective bearers of your grace. Here we are, the servants of the Lord. Let it be with us according to your word. Loving Lord, you have lifted up the humble and we have exalted the rich and given allegiance to the powerful. Help us, Heavenly Father, to remember that the rich have their reward, that even the powerful come very soon before your throne of grace, and that those we have so often disregarded have a prior claim on your love and first call on our care as we seek to work for your kingdom in your name. In your almighty power, loving God, you call upon us to seek out the lost and the lonely. You demand of your children that we give succor to the weakest, housing the homeless and feeding the hungry. We pray that you will remind us constantly through the words and teaching of your son, whose coming amongst us is in the strength of his helplessness and the splendor of his simplicity. Teach us about the power of worldly weakness that true exaltation is only given to those who give themselves truly in the service of others, and that our true allegiance is not to the power of presidents, prime ministers, princes or plutocrats, but to your name and to your kingdom, which is the reign of your grace and love, which extends to all. Here we are, the servants of the Lord. Let it be with us according to your word. Gracious God, you have filled your promise of mercy to all your children, and we have hardened our hearts to our brethren and sisters. Lord Christ, hear our prayers for those we have so often condemned first and cared for last. Remind us in our work for you that whilst we might know and witness to all which in the world besmirches your name, it appears to frustrate your purpose. Only you can truly see not just what your children are, but what each of them, including us, might become. As in the midst of the pandemic, we observe countless acts of heroism and love. Remind us that those same heroes, who are so often the best of us, are as frail and as needy in their own way as the most vulnerable and even the most despicable amongst us. Help us to look with your eyes on what we would otherwise perceive as unmitigated disaster and to see your imperfect children as still being capable of grace, still bearers of that precious gift of life, still people for whom you were prepared yourself to die and as you died for us all, and still heirs to the promise of that love which transcends every story or of even the least of us. Here we are, the servants of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. Amen. Heavenly Father, receive these gifts of love and use them so that in love we might find those who are loveless, succour and give strength to the needy. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, hopefully the youngsters are coming back in before we uh, finish with our last hymn. They're on the way. They can tell us what they've been deciding makes Christ the King. Here they come. Wow! That is one big crown.
Excellent. Wow, that's a really good one. So turn around and show us, look at all those words. So these are the things that make Jesus the king, or Christ the king. He's a true friend, I like that one. Understands everyone's needs. So that Jesus is our neighbour. That's a good one, the idea that we find Christ the king in our neighbour. That's brilliant, they've been listening to me for the last few weeks. Excellent. Right, that he's a miracle worker, that's true, and that he's always with us, that he's merciful. Oh, these are really good. And you've all contributed to that, haven't you? And that's in him live a big crown, but what have you put on top of the crown? A cross. Because we recognise Jesus, the one who was sent to the cross for us and who was risen from the dead. So all of that crown depends on that cross, doesn't it, in that drawing, which is really good or depends from the cross, I should say. Isn't that excellent? So those are all the things that you've decided make Jesus the King of Kings. Yes? Christ the King. Well done. How about that, everybody? Thank you. Right, shall we sing our last hymn? Yes, yeah, Singing of Faith, Christ whose glory fills the skies, 134. Thank you. I, I'll tell you what, can we put that up on the... Um, can we put it here? Have we got any blue tack over there? Are we not allowed blue tack? Have I said the wrong thing? Hang on, stay there, we'll get some blue tack. We must have some somewhere, surely. Yeah, well, I think we'll leave it there if that's all. Right, okay. You can go and sit up down and we'll put this here when the blue tack arrives. Whilst, I'm, whilst we're singing the hymn, I guess. Three, two, eight, in singing of faith, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun. May Christ reign in our hearts and in the heart of our community. And may, be, and may God's love be shared amongst all who are in need. And may we come into that kingdom which we proclaim and of which we are citizens. 
And may the blessing of God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon us and remain with us all, today and always. Amen. <laughs>